I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's International Programs and the University of Iowa's Honors Program. They contribute vital time, talent, and logistics to our organization. I also want to thank the Stanley U of I Foundation support organization on their financial support, and I thank today's special sponsors, Bridget and Adam Ingersoll and Dave and Diane Martin. It is my pleasure to introduce Zubair Shafiq. Zubair Shafiq is Associate Professor in the University of Iowa's Department of Computer Science, and he also is a member of the Iowa Informatics Initiative. Zubair received his PhD in Computer Science from Michigan State University in 2014, and he received his bachelor's degree from National University of Sciences and Technology, Pakistan, in 2008. Please join me in welcoming Zubair Shafiq. Thanks for the introduction. So, I'm a computer scientist. Um, let me pull this up. So, I'm a computer scientist by trade, and my research primarily involves studying the internet. So, I try to answer basic questions like how big is the internet, how people use the internet, right? But the special focus of my research recently has been studying security and privacy concerns on the internet. So, that's what I'm going to talk with you guys about today. So the talk today is really focused on how companies collect our data um, when you browse the internet, when you browse the web, and how this data is used to profile your behavior, and how these companies monetize this data. And then in the second part of my talk, I will talk about how governments can and are currently picking back on this data, which is collected by internet companies, to do surveillance on their citizens. Um, so before I really go into the details of this, I would like to provide you a bird's eye view of what happens when you open your web browser and you type in a name of a website. So let's say um, you use a browser, let's say Chrome. In this case, there are multiple browsers out there. It really does not matter which browser you are particularly using. So all you do is you type in the address of a website and then you press Enter. In this particular case, let's say you want to book a hotel room for the Hawkeyes ball game against Florida. Um, and you want to book a hotel, right? So you go to hotels.com and you press enter. So as soon as this process, as, as soon as you press enter, the first thing that happens is your browser sends out a request to hotels.com server to fetch a web page. So for this purpose, browser uses a computer network protocol, which is called HTTP. So really, it's a computerized protocol. It is a language which this remote server understands. And as a response, this server will send back an HTML file. So this is really a text file. And this text file contains a list of all the resources that your browser has to subsequently download from hotels.com server or some other servers to render a web page. So you can know like which hotels are available and so on and so forth. So this HTML file, which is written back to your browser, this contains a list of resources. And the resources are typically images. They could be um, style sheets. These could be some computer scripts, which have to be executed so that you can actually see the web page. So the point is, after you download this initial file, your browser has to make several subsequent requests to download the whole web page. In this case, you would notice that these requests are mostly going to hotels.com server. <coughs> right? So that's kind of the impression people have when you go to hotels.com. All of your communication is with hotels.com server. But that's actually not the case. A vast majority of requests from your browser are actually going to other servers as well. So as a user, you probably don't even realize this, but if you peek under the hood of your browser, you would, in the case of hotels.com, you would notice that you are actually connecting to more than 50 different web servers, which are not owned by hotels.com. So these are the third-party servers, which I'm going to call trackers. Okay, so these are different 
companies which are tracking you, looking at which web pages and websites you are visiting when you are only going to hotels.com. So these are the companies who collect your data, who package your data, and oftentimes sell this data to other companies, and we'll talk about why they actually do that. And I'm calling them third-party trackers because this is not the site you were intending to visit. You typed in hotels.com. You did not know that you would actually send a request to comscore.com, or in this case, um, doubleclick.com, right? So most of you probably don't, haven't even heard of these names. So these third-party trackers, they are on all popular websites. You really cannot escape them. So that's the key message. So for example, if you go to nytimes.com, and comscore.com has a tracker on that website, and then later you go on to ebay.com, and comscore also has a tracker on that website, then comscore knows that you first went to newyorktimes.com and then went to ebay.com. Right? So this is how they actually kind of track you from site to site. So just to give you some more detail without really um, giving into super, without being super specific, how do they do this? So to track you from site to site, they need to assign you a unique identifier. This identifier is very similar to your social security number, right? But think of that as a unique identifier in the online space. So most of you know probably when you connect to the internet, your network assigns you an IP address. So this is a computerized address which is assigned to your machine, right? So they can use this IP address to track you, but the problem is if you have a laptop and let's say after this you go to Starbucks and connect to their internet, your IP address will change. So they cannot use this, use this IP address as your unique identifier to track you across different sites. So they have to use something else. And the thing which is most popular is the innocent sounding cookies which are not super delicious. These are actually just text strings, which are unique identifiers, which these websites instruct your web browser to actually store locally. So whenever you go to a website, um, your browser automatically attaches this cookie, which is stored on your computer. This cookie is a text string, which uniquely identifies you across site to site. Now, the thing is, if you are more familiar with how these browsers work, you can actually go to your browser and you can delete these cookies. So you actually have some control over these unique identifiers. And obviously, this breaks the tracking model that these companies operate on. So re more recently, they have started using these so-called fingerprinting attacks. And in these fingerprinting attacks, they use these weird, um, weird tools to actually uniquely identify your browser and yourself. So one of the famous techniques that they use is called canvas fingerprinting. So the idea behind these techniques is every machine is unique. So if I do the same operation on my machine and ask you to do the exact same thing on your browser, your machine, your machine will do it in a slightly different way. So machines, just like humans, also have these unique fingerprints. So in this case, they will ask your browser to draw a drawing it will be a drawing which you would not see. It will be hidden from you. And every browser, every computer does it in a slightly different way. And because you are doing this in a slightly different way, this information can be used to uniquely identify you. Right? So this is something that a user has no control over. You do have no clue that this information can be used to uniquely identify you. Another thing which is very popular is they ask your browser to process a unique sound. So every browser, when they have to generate a sound or process a sound, they actually do it in a slightly different way. And just as you can then identify humans by their sounds, your machine can be identified based on these audio signals. And in addition to these, there are many other techniques that these um, companies use to uniquely identify users across site to site. Okay? So these are just a few examples. And the key point to take away from here is user actually sometimes has, has no clue about what are these techniques. You cannot restrict them. You are not even aware of these techniques which are used to uniquely identify you across the internet. Okay? So let's look at another question. So we are now going to try to answer how many of these trackers are out there, which websites have these trackers, um, and who are these trackers, right? So these are the questions. Let's try to look at um, this in more depth. So just to give you a sense, so they are obviously plentiful. They're everywhere. So just to give you an idea, if you read any of these news sites, um, they have dozens of trackers. So for example, 
New, um, Fox News has 64 trackers to 64 different companies. If you go to New York Times, you have 24 trackers. News websites are actually notorious for tracking users across the web. Okay, But this does not end there. If you go to webmd.com, which is one of the popular sites to figure out if you have a health problem, um, you would be surprised to know that 17 different trackers are tracking you on that website. So these companies can know if you think you have a disease, right? Or if you're searching for cancer, or if you're searching for another health problem. So they can figure, the, figure out this information. Um, if you go to healthcare.gov to buy health insurance, you would think it's a government website, right? So there should not be any tracker on that website. But you are tracked by six different companies on healthcare.gov. In fact, I went to <laughs> icfrc.org, and turns out, Probably you didn't intend this, but whoever designed the website, there are five different trackers who are tracking you for advertising purposes. I actually looked at the website. You're not actually serving any ads. So it's weird why you have these trackers in the first place. So, so, so these are kind of like odd. They appear everywhere, and you probably don't even notice it. Even the web designers who are designing these websites, they don't even notice that you actually leave these trackers on different sites. right? Um, so who are these trackers? So this is a plot which is showing you the popularity of different trackers. And on x-axis, I have the names of those companies. So the most popular tracker, which tr tracks you across more than 80% of top 1 million websites on the internet, is Google. right? So these are the big internet companies. On the second place, we have Facebook. And then we have Twitter. right? So these are the names that we know. right? So all of us probably use Facebook. Twitter, or Google in one way or the other. But one thing to note here is there is a long tail of relatively unknown trackers, which actually most of us have no idea that they exist. So names like, for example, AppNexus, something most people have not really heard about. And these are all other companies which are tracking you across the web. So let's try to talk a little bit more about, so now that hopefully you understand that this tracking is happening, this is pervasive, as soon as you open your web browser and type a name of a website, you are being tracked by one of these trackers. So let's try to figure out why are they tracking you, right? So what's their motivation? So what's the incentive? So this is what I call surveillance capitalism. So most of these companies make off money off of advertising. So they want to show you advertisements. So that's the business they are in. You don't have to pay to use Gmail. You don't have to use. You don't have to pay to use Facebook. So they are making money off of you by showing you advertisements, and that's the reason why they are um, they are tracking you across the web. So the advertising seems very simple, right? So you you see an ad. There is nothing bad about it. There is no bad intention. If you like something, you click on it. You buy something. Sounds very normal to me initially, but let's look at a little deeper to figure out what exactly is going on and why these ads are not as simple as they initially seem. So let's take a history lesson for a quick second. So this is what it used to be. You had these news publishers who would write whatever they want to write, and they would leave these boxes. right? And these boxes can then be filled out by advertisers. right? So you would look at these um, advertisements in these paper newspapers. And if you like something, you maybe would make a call, and you would buy them. Right? So that was the business model. Life was very simple. And what these advertisers would do is they would recruit these um, advertising agencies to design ads for you. So advertising was more of an art rather than a science at that point in time. So one of the big complaints in advertising um, back in the day was that most of the advertising is not very effective. You cannot really tell as an advertiser whether people like your ad or whether they have actually bought anything after seeing your ad. So you would, so the rough estimate was half of your advertising budget was wasted. And you didn't even know which half was that one. right? So, so that kind of was the big pain in traditional offline advertising. So it was a very simple trinity. So there were three players in this ecosystem. On the left side, you had advertisers. So think of this as Coca-Cola, who is trying to advertise. In the middle, you have a publisher, let's say New York Times. And then on the right side, we have consumers, so people who are buying these newspapers and seeing ads on these newspapers. And newspapers actually earned a lot of money from this. So in this graph, I'm showing you the amount of 
ad revenue that these companies had. On x-axis, we have time. This goes back up to 1950. On y-axis, we have the revenue in billions of dollars. So you can see that all the way up to roughly 2000, their advertising revenue was increasing, reached up to $67 billion. So that's a lot, right? But then you see something happen. And this revenue started to decline really fast. And there are a couple of other companies whose curves actually started to shoot rapidly up. So the two curves which are shown in this plot is Google and Facebook. OK, so, so what happened? This happened, right? So the promise of online advertising. And so the idea was in traditional advertising, you really cannot tell whether your advertisements are effective. In online advertising, I can show someone an ad about losing weight if I know that they are conscious about their weight problems. Right? So you can now precisely target people based on their behavior. So that's kind of really the promise of online advertising. And another nice thing was you can actually measure how effective your ads were. You can tell whether people actually clicked on your ads. So this was really a paradigm change. And this online advertising business took off in early 2000s. So this ecosystem obviously changed. So remember, previously, there were only three players. Now a bunch of additional players got into this business. And by what these additional companies in this ecosystem were doing, what they were tracking users. So they were trying to make sure that you liked the ads, they were showing you relevant ads, and they were figuring out whether you were clicking on those ads. So the, for the first time, advertisers could know um, how many ads have been shown, how many people have actually clicked on them. And another nice thing that happened in online advertising was um, a website, let's say New York Times, did not have to sell these ads themselves. So there were these ad exchanges which were created using which um, they could fill up those rectangles on their websites. Okay? So in this case, they would, could just simply ask Google to actually serve ads on NewYorkTimes.com. So everybody was happy. Everyone was making money here. And advertisers looked upon this and saw everything is good, right? So everyone is making more money. But there was a big problem. And the big problem was this one. So I would just give you a second to consume this. This is like a famous New Yorker um, cartoon published in 1993. So there is a dog telling to another dog, no one on the internet, that you are a dog, right? So the problem with online advertising was um, these click farms or click fraud. Because on the internet, you cannot really tell who is who. So there were people who would create these bogus websites. They would put ads on their websites, and they would click them themselves. Or they would actually create computer programs, which are called bots, to click on those ads to make money off of advertisers. So this is called click fraud. And then, obviously, there were simple ways to detect these bots. So then some of these fraudsters, they created click farms in developing countries. They would recruit young people there, um, old grandparents there to just open a website and just click on ads. So that's all they would do. They would earn a few dollars. But then overall, there was significant return that this problem would go on. So the key challenge online advertisers faced was, how do you tell if a click on my ad is actually real or fake? right? And the industry's response to this problem was this. They increased the complexity even more. So more players were introduced here. Now they were actually precisely targeting people. They were tracking individual users across different websites using some of the techniques that I just mentioned. Right? And the main reason to increase this complexity was to figure out where is click fraud happening and obviously eliminating them from the ecosystem. Another big reason this complexity increased was, was to increase targeted advertising. So to show targeted <coughs> ads to users, you really need to know about some person, right? So you need to collect some data about a person to figure out what kind of ad might be relevant to a person. So this started the so-called data wars between internet companies. So there was a race who had more data about users. So Google obviously started off initially with a search engine, right? And you would go and you would type questions on a search engine, and they would know what you are searching about. So they could very accurately tell who you are, what are your interests, what are, when you're about to make a purchase, for example. And then Facebook happened, and Google was caught off guard a little bit. And they created a social network. 
and now people were willingly share all sorts of information about their lives on the internet. So they could very precisely know when are you going to watch a sports game and when are you checking in with your friends, who do you meet? All this information people are now voluntarily uploading on the internet, right? And these companies not only collect this data themselves, they also collaborate with all these other companies. So they share this information with each other, all with the goal of eliminating click fraud and to show you targeted ads. Right? So the companies which could do this better, they would earn more money. Because advertisers could go and precisely target specific segments of population with the ads. So the situation has changed since 1993. And this is the current state of the affairs. So they know a lot. Now they know if you're a dog, right? So no one is anonymous on the internet anymore. So let me give you a simple example. So I'm not picking on any particular advertising company. So this is just one company for which I could easily go to their public brochures and figure out what is the information they claim they have on users in the US specifically. So this information is from their public brochure. So this is Experian. So this is something they say they have, um, they claim to have. So they have information about 299 million consumers in the US. They have information about 116 households. And they have dozens of these data points telling what is your age, what is your education, what is your income, what is your occupation, whether you have children. All this information is stored by advertising companies like this, right? So they know a lot about you initially if you just look at the surface. But they actually know a lot more. They actually try to profile you in different segments. So this is something I really like. They have this like mom segment. So they have, I think, 21 of, 19 of these mom segments. So they know if you're a mom who is into coupons, or if you have one children, or if you have two children, or if you do outdoor activities. So they put people into these boxes, these segments. Right? So that's kind of like sounds a little scary. They know this much about our families, everyone here who is sitting here. Right? And then they know some other sensitive information as well. They know our national origin. They know our ethnicities. Right? So this is the information they claim. They can precisely tell which is the country you immigrated from. So this information is very sensitive. And this is something I was really astounded by. They know our little secrets. They know if I like fast food. They know if I like to play lotteries. They know if I have certain health insurance. They know if I'm conscious about my weight. So they have a lot of information on the whole US population, and obviously millions more around the world. right? So we don't know what they know, and they know a lot. So this is kind of a problem. right? And it's kind of obvious. What could possibly go wrong here? <laughs> right? So these companies here have all this data on us. You would think they are only doing this to show you ads. And obviously, there would be some bad situations that would arise all, out of all of this. So the first thing that happened is recently, so I talked about these companies have ethnic information about people, about their national origin. right? So collecting this information is actually not unlawful. You may think it is unethical, but it is not unlawful. It is only unlawful to have this information or use this information in specific context. So for example, if you use this information to exclude people from housing-related advertisements, you are actually violating the Fair Housing Act. Because you cannot discriminate people on the basis of their race or on the basis of their national origin. If you use this information to deny people credit or deny people access to um, loans, that is unlawful under the Consumer Credit Protection Act. And Facebook, in this recent case, was allowing advertisers to actually exclude certain ethnicities on their targeted ads, even when they were these ads were related to housing or related to credit-related uh, applications. Right? So this is kind of a problem. And obviously, these advertisers know our race. They know our religion. They know our sexual orientation. And if they can target ads, include and exclude certain demographics, this would violate certain laws. And Facebook recently decided to stop doing this. But again, this is kind of like one problem that one big company addressed, but this practice probably is very prevalent out there. 
And in the context of recent elections, so there are these so-called adver adversarial advertising campaigns. So President Obama was actually using targeted ads going as far back as 2008, and a lot more in 2012. And the RNC actually learned this lesson, and they started this so-called project, Project Alamo, where they would actually collaborate with these um, data brokers on the internet to precisely target different users. And one of the reports that has come out is not only they were targeting people who were tilting towards Republicans, they were also targeting people who were tilting towards Democrats. And the idea was to suppress votes in this particular case. So you could tell who was the person who was thinking of voting for Bernie Sanders, but now was contemplating whether to vote for Hillary Clinton, for example. And then you can actually target ads to that demographic and show them targeted ads to suppress votes. So this is a very interesting report. If you're interested in this, I would be happy to talk more about you. And more recently, we have been hearing about these fake news, right? So on Facebook, so this is an actual screenshot I took yesterday. You can actually go and you can target ads by political affiliation. And recently, there have been these news that these, in addition to regular advertising by campaigns, there were these companies who were showing, who were trying to perpetuate these fake news on Facebook. And in this case, I'm assuming like my profile is a little democratic. So I saw this ad from, so this news story ad from CNN, which says that um, um, the vote count has been turned over and he is no longer our president, right? So this is the kind of a fake news they are trying to target to a specific audience so I can click. And why are they showing me this ad? So when I click and I go and see their ads, they make money off of it. So they want these fake stories to go viral so they can make money off of it. Does that make sense? So, so this is what I call weaponized advertising, right? So this is far more of a problem than adversarial advertising. They target fake news, for example, to suppress vote or to just make more money off of it. And this is another interesting example. So there was this company, Moonshot CVE, and Google's Jigsaw Technology Incubator. They started off this radical program, and the idea was they would identify people who are sympathetic to ISIS. And they would show them people, sh show those people ads which would, refuse, which would refute ISIS propaganda, right? So sounds very normal to you, initially speaking. Something that you would think is a good thing to do. But then there were plans to use the same technology to target right-wing parties in the US. So right-wing um, organizations like KKK in efforts to de-radicalize them. So this is just like some examples of how these ads are being used by technology companies in different creative and interesting ways. Right? You can imagine there could be all sorts of bad ramifications if this goes unchecked. So in the second part of my talk, I would really like to focus on how governments can and then they do piggyback on this data to do surveillance on um, the citizens. So in the US, you are protected by the Fourth Amendment, which protects you from unlawful searches, unlawful seizure of your property. Um, so this was ratified really back in the days, 1792. Right? There was no internet. There were no modern forms of communication. So really, the law was not written with this intent to protect people's privacy. But really, the privacy in the US Constitution originates from this Fourth Amendment. So after the Watergate scandal, there was a new law which was passed, which was called FISA. FISA means Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It was passed in 1978. And the provisions that were added was that if the government wants to spy on any US citizen, wants to collect information about any US citizen, they have to get a court order first, right? So this was a simple protection which was added in this FISA Act after the Watergate scandal. So this was reasonably well, but after the 9-11, a new act was passed called Patriot Act. And this Patriot Act really undermined some of these protections which were passed in the original FISA Act. And under this new Patriot Act, the US government, specifically the National Security Agency, started a secret program to collect information about all consumers in the internet. So they would collect bulk information about users that they can later on use to identify terrorists, for example. So that was their application in this particular case. 
and they could go out under this act to any internet company and ask them for information. And these companies would have to collaborate with them. So these were called national security letters. And the important thing was these companies were not allowed to disclose that they are actually sharing this information with the government. So these were the so-called gag orders that the companies had to comply with. So all this was done in super secrecy. No one actually knew about this until this happened. Right? So in 2013, Edward Snowden, who was an NSA contractor at the time, he was former CIA employee, and he was previously a contractor in different situations with the NSA. He leaked classified NSA documents, which revealed the extent to which this data collection program and spying was going on. Right? And he shared these documents with um, some journalists who actually looked at this information, figured out what to publish, what to redact, and so on and so forth. So one of the big revelations in the NSA leaks was that the government was piggybacking on all the information which is collected by internet companies, going as far back as 2007, starting off with Microsoft, and then including Yahoo, and Google, and Facebook, and YouTube, and Skype, and so on and so forth. So these companies, they didn't fight back, primarily because they received these orders, which seemed legal at that time. And they, obviously, these companies have a lot of business to do with the US government. right? So they cannot start off a costly legal war with the government and cannot deny this. So this program was called PRISM program. And under this program, companies were directly com working with the US government to give all this information for the purposes of detecting terrorist activity. So after this was revealed in the media, obviously there was a big backlash. So the, com the companies were fearing that people around the world, they would stop using their services. Obviously, if you know that if everything I upload on the Facebook is going to the NSA, you wouldn't stop using Facebook. And that did happen to a small extent. But then these companies um, started to actually add some protections. And after this was made public, they were really angry. They went to the White House, and they lobbied the government to actually stop this program, or at least add some transparency to this. But there was another program which was later on leaked by the NSA revelation. So this was an NSA program called Muscular. Under this program, the US government would not directly work with the companies, but instead all these cables which go around across the world, which carry your internet traffic, the government would actually tap onto these pipes of internet. And they would collect this information without the knowledge of internet companies. And then they would look at all this information which is included in your internet traffic, things like cookies, which uniquely identify you, things like fingerprints, which again uniquely identify you, to track people across the world. And they created this government search engine called X key score, using which you can actually search. So who went to Germany and speaks Arabic? And you can specifically identify all those users from this uh, government search engine. And this bulk data collection, this was finally ruled illegal in 2015, after it was revealed, um, two years after the Snowden revelations, obviously. So that had something to do with this. And after this, there was a variation of Patriot Act, a reform kind of passed, which was called USA Freedom Act in 2015, with some improved constraints, but still this surveillance is going on to some extent, with some added protections, but still, in my personal opinion, not enough. And obviously, we think in the US we are living in a democratic society, right? But the rest of the world is not as transparent as this, even though we have seen the situation in the US too. So you can think of countries like China, which already have massive censorship programs where they track information, internet information about users. And they censor information which goes against the political ideology of the government. Right? So they have this great firewall of China, which is, in the, which is already in place. And the Chinese government wants to use the same platform, and now they want to turn it to get some information about citizens. So they want to assign citizens a social credit score. It's like your credit score, but it's like a social credit score. So if you get involved in some activity that the government does not like, they would deduct 10 points from your score. And then you would have penalties like you cannot get a room in a nicer hotel. You cannot send your children to a good school, for example. 
right? So these kind of things can happen, and they will happen outside the US. So there are like these international ramifications of this online tracking, which then feeds into government surveillance. So really the message I want to deliver to this audience is, there is this corporate surveillance, right, which is going on for the purposes of advertising. And then the government actually piggies backs on all this information which is collected by internet companies and uses this information to do surveillance on users. So the NSA and FBI, they probably love Facebook and Google, right? So they don't have to do any effort really now for this. So people willingly upload this information on Facebook. So the general sentiment in the intelligence community, if you like talk to them, is that if the people are okay with giving up all this information just to use some free services and to see ads, it's perfectly okay to collect this information to s provide national security, right? Which is kind of a false argument where you try to trade off between privacy and security. But it's not that people don't care about privacy. All of you in the room probably, if you know this, you're probably hopefully outraged at this. And you care about your privacy. You want your internet activities to be private. And users do. So according to a recent Pew Research survey, more than 90% of the people, they say they very strongly, so they, it is very important to them, important or very important, what information is collected about them and who is collecting this information. But the problem is privacy is very hard. As a user, you really don't know where to start, how to protect your privacy. Um, so really, the last point here shows that users, more than 90% of the users, they have a feeling of giving up. They think they have lost control. There is nothing they can do, right? So that's kind of a sense of like giving up. So how can we change this situation? So one way to change this situation is through activism. So there are these companies like ACLU, so these organizations, nonprofits like ACLU, Electronic Frontier Foundation, which are actually trying to stop government surveillance. So this picture is showing an NSA data center in Utah. And ACLU had this banner flowing above them with a sign like illegal spying going on below. And they're obviously fighting the US government by suing some of these activities in courts. And that has been happening over some time and will continue to happen. But this probably is not enough. So you can obviously think you can do regulations, right, in the US Congress to try to solve this situation to some extent, or in some executive bodies like the Federal Trade Commission, which is responsible to monitor internet companies and see if they're involved in anything uh, which can be of harm to US consumers. Or the FCC, which controls all these telecommunication companies like AT&T and Verizon. And then, you can also do some technical countermeasures, which our research group at the University of Iowa is trying to do in this particular case. So let's look at some of the regulations uh, real quick. So in the US, FTC, Federal Trade Commission, have the authority to regulate all internet companies. But they have been very lenient on internet companies. They haven't actually asked they haven't actually passed any meaningful regulation to stop this data collection, to increase privacy, to increase transparency. So what they have started off doing is the so-called self-regulation, where they talk to internet companies and they ask them to self-regulate themselves. How would that go? <laughs> so they started this program called Ad Choices. And you see this icon when in, in most cases when you see an ad on the internet. And the idea was you would see this icon and you can actually figure out why am I seeing this ad. But this program actually does not allow you to completely opt out of all the tracking that the companies do. Right? So this really does not go far enough. There was another effort which was called Do Not Track. So your browser will have this thing that you can turn on and off. And if you have this Do Not Track option, then the internet companies would willingly not track you. And this was kind of killed when it was being developed. So this did not even pass. And more recently, the FCC has actually passed some regulation which has stopped um, telecommunication providers like AT&T, um, Comcast, Time Warner, Mediacom to collect information from users when you actually buy internet service from them. So they are now not allowed to look at your traffic and do advertising off of it. So at least there is some protection now in this case. But as the government changes, most of these regulations were passed three to two. And the balance of the government would change and probably most of these protections would be changed very soon. 
So really, it's up to technical countermeasures as a user that I think we should try to embrace. So the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they have this browser add-on, which is called Privacy Badger, that you can install on your web browser. Right? So they actually have some logic using which they try to figure out if there is a company trying to track you, and they block those requests from leaving your web browser. And then there are some companies like Ghostry. They are proprietary. They don't open source their code, so you don't really know what exactly they are doing with your data, whether they are actually protecting your privacy. So the biggest, the most popular tool that has been widely deployed are these so-called ad blockers. So how many in this room have heard of the term ad blocker before? So that's good. So that's pretty good. Um, so there are these browser extensions like ad block plus or U block origin. So what these ad blockers do is they are installed in your browser, and they have a publicly available filter list of these bad companies, bad domains, to which your browser is not allowed to send out any request. So there are these lists for trackers. There are these lists for advertisements as well. So using these ad blockers, you can block all the ads, and you can also block all the trackers. And everything is in the public. It's open source. You can go and look ex to figure out what exactly they are doing. And the nice thing is ad blockers have been used, are now used by hundreds of millions of people around the world. So according to a recent estimate by PageFear, more than 600 million people around the world now use ad blockers. So this is fantastic. So all of you who are here who have not heard of the ad blocker and you use any browser, you can go Google this up and you can install an ad blocker, ad blocker in no time without requiring any technical information. So please do that. So in the US, 18% of users use an ad blocker. And specifically in certain categories, like for example, males 18 to 34, more than 30% of users in the US use an ad blocker. And in Germany, more than 50% use an ad blocker. So ad blockers are increasing. Now what is happening with these ad blockers is internet companies are losing revenue, right? So when they are not able to show you ads, they are not making money off of you. So this is kind of a problem for them. And it has started an arms race between companies and ad blockers. So internet companies, they are trying to now undermine your ad blocker. And what would sometime happen is, if you go to a website with an ad blocker, they would show you this notice. And they would say that you are using an ad blocker, please turn off this ad blocker, because otherwise we cannot make money. Right? <laughs> you can do that, but obviously then the whole tra tracking and all that nasty stuff would start off. So, so one of the things, so, th so this, so we call these anti-ad blockers, and these technologies are now used by popular companies like the Washington Post, the Wired, and the Forbes. They have started deploying this, and this is increasing over time. So these attempts to undermine ad blockers would mean a return to the status quo where tracking would be prevalent. And these ad blockers, they're forcing internet companies to take action. And some of the internet companies, they have now started to do less invasive advertising programs. They are kind of like trying to reform themselves. But really, all this has happened after these ad blockers, which are now used by hundreds of millions of people, which are forcing internet companies by hitting their bottom line and forcing them to actually react to consumers' concerns about bad ads and tracking. So our research group is working on stealthy ad blockers. So we are doing research to develop ad blockers which cannot be detected by websites. So when you go on a website, and you have an ad blocker on with hopefully, once we are fully developed this product, a website would not be able to tell whether you have an ad blocker or not, ad blocker on or not. So you can safely use your ad blocker and protect yourself um, from these trackers and ads. So just to conclude, um, kind of running out of time. So really, it's all about data, data, data. So there are these data wars. So to show you better ads, company needs more data. And whatever company has more data, they will make more money off of you. So this is actually not bad, right? So we want to support the internet. We want internet to be free. It's not that we want to stop all advertising on the internet. That's not really the goal here. But right now, the goal is if we want to maximize the contribution data is making to individuals, to society, to the economy, right? So these are three things that you have to balance. Right now, the focus is only on economy. So companies want to maximize their profit. But I think this order should be changed. And individuals should always be put first when trying to make money off of data of people. So we believe it should always be the individual first. And we want to put users in control 
of deciding whether certain ads and trackers are okay. And again, I would conclude with a plea. So if you don't have an ad blocker, please install an ad blocker. Thank you. <laughs> so in the spirit of full disclosure, um, so uh, we have received funding for this project from Data Transparency Lab, which is funded by MIT Connection Science, Mozilla Foundation, and Telefonica. And for some other projects, we have received funds from the National Science Foundation and Facebook. Thank you. How can individuals see what trackers are on a site? Uh, example, Hotels.com. So I will come back to my last plea. So if you install an ad blocker, they would actually show you how many trackers are on a website and which trackers are there. And they would show you how many of the trackers they have blocked on a site. So if you install this browser add-on, which is free, open source, you can take care of this problem. Can third-party trackers use your MAC address as your identifier? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a little technical question, but the technically correct answer is no. They cannot use your MAC address because your MAC address does not travel outside your network, but they don't have to use your MAC address. They have these other unique identifiers like um, cookies and fingerprints that they can use to uniquely identify you. But the answer to this question is no, they cannot use your MAC address. Which websites are more likely to have third-party trackers? Why those websites in specific? So research has shown that mostly these trackers are on news websites. And if you think a little about it, it actually makes sense. Because these are the sites which are losing subscriptions, offline subscriptions, right? So people, very few people now subscribe to hard copies of newspapers. So really, the source of their revenue is advertising, online advertising. So these are the kind of websites which really show you uh, most ads, which really do a lot of intrusive tracking. And some of the other websites which I did not talk about was some of these websites which show you um, movies, right? So there are these movie streaming sites which are which have like copyright content and they're illegally showing you these, this content. So those kind of websites also have a ton of trackers and ads on them. But if you just stay in strictly the legal set of websites, news websites are first on the list, mostly because most of their revenue depends on online advertising. So they track you more, they show you more ads, and that's kind of like their business model now. Can users disguise or alter their email metadata? Um, so this is an overloaded question a little bit. So, so email metadata means your email address. If that's I were to guess, you cannot hide your email address, right? So you have to publish your email address. What you should do and you should try to do is securely save the content of your email. So for example, Gmail, a few years ago, started scanning your email content to show you relevant ads. So there are these programs which are actually reading your email. So those are the kind of things you should try to protect yourself from. You can obviously try to use a service which does not do this. Use something other than Gmail, for example. But more and more companies, because these email services are free, so they have to make money, right? So they would look at your emails and try to extract information to show you relevant ads. So my answer to you would be, Try to use an email provider which has a policy of not scanning your email content um, or encrypting your email content. This is currently very hard now for non-technical users, but there is research on this to make this as seamless as possible. So only you and the recipient would know what is the content of an email. And an email company which is hosting your email would not know what is the content in the email that you have. So hopefully that would start to happen very soon. Is the information collected on tax preparation services uh, like TurboTax shared or sold? So I would like to not answer this question because I don't know. So I would like to present facts. But you have to read the terms of service of um, the company, right? So I'm, I haven't actually investigated TurboTax, for example. But really, the problem that I would like to highlight here is it's very hard to answer, even if you try to answer this question. 
And the simple reason is when you go and sign up on any of these websites, you have to click on yes to this huge terms of service agreement, which if you believe it or not, is actually a legal agreement that you enter into when you click on yes or you click on agree. And these terms of service, um, they're hard to understand for the layman people. I think Apple's terms of service that you have to agree to when you have to update your iOS, someone actually printed them and they were like 53 pages long in like th 10 point font. So you cannot expect people to read those agreements and actually make decisions or figure out whether these companies are going to sell this information to other companies. But companies like Google and Facebook, in their terms of service, they say that we will use your information for advertising purposes. We will share your information with third parties. So, so that's kind of the convoluted answer. Is DuckDuckGo a workable blocking browser? No. <laughs> <laughs> With Google, uh, Uber, etc., we are becoming unpaid employees as they track our choices to. Oh, <laughs> train uh, in their machines. Is there any way to make these exchanges more explicit for consumers? Right, so I'm glad that you have this observation. Mm -hmm. so, so the simple thing is, if you are not paying for a product, you are the product, right? So even though you agree on actually giving all this information to these internet companies, there should be regulations which give more transparency to users. And this has actually only recently started to happen. So for example, if you see an ad on Facebook, now they have started to show this icon on the top right of an ad where you can click and you can try to figure out why am I seeing this ad? And they would tell you how did the company who is advertising to you figure out that you were the person they want to show this ad. But again, this is very restricted information. You still have little idea what information they have about you, right? And who they are exchanging this information. So right now, all this is happening under this notion of self-regulation. So unless there is explicit government regulation forcing these companies to be more transparent about their practices, there cannot be any progress, at least in the US. In the EU, they have recently passed a very comprehensive bill which is called General Data Protection, uh, Protection Regulation, GDPR, under which internet companies operating in EU are required to actually disclose this information to users, what information they collect about them. And companies are actually even required to delete information about you. So if you go to Google and then say, I don't want this search result about me on your website, companies are required to comply with this information, to delete information about you. So the situation is much better in the EU, but unfortunately it's not as good as it should be in the US. Can one edit a cookie to confuse a tracker? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> so that's actually one of the research techniques we are using. So we call this forging. So we want to confuse these trackers, right? So they set a cookie, but then we tinker with the cookie to mess up with their system. And one of the companies which actually started to use this, I would call this technology. So it's like a, it's a cute idea, right? So they actually got a legal notice from one of the advertisers. And they said that stop doing this, you're messing up with our system. <laughs> so that's a good idea. So if you're touching some nerves, you're probably have onto something right. Is there a, a way to identify, eliminate fingerprints? So yes, so if you install an ad blocker now, so people are starting to include in the blacklist some of these rules to take care of fingerprinting. But this problem is a very hard problem because you, it's very hard for you to, even for a specialized computer programmer, to analyze code of a web page and figure out whether they are doing fingerprinting or not. It's actually incredibly hard to even detect that it's happening. And then once you detect it, coming up with rules which can block this kind of fingerprinting, again, it's very hard. So right now, the current state of the situation is whenever some of these nasty techniques are discovered that companies are using to track users, there is a shaming onslaught that happens in the news industry. And then thankfully some of those companies stop using those techniques. 
But as soon as the public backlash goes down, they again start using these techniques. So that's kind of the situation, unfortunately, we live in right now. These two questions are somewhat related, so I'm going to combine them. Have you heard of the possibility to listen in to people's lives through mobile phones, and how can this be counteracted and comment on tracking on your cell phone? Um, so the first question is about like listening to information on a cell phone. So I'm thinking you're worried about your mic, for example, someone has your mic turned on. So this primarily happens in hacking. So we're um, hackers try to send you a computer program, and if you click on this on your mobile device, um, your mic, for example, would always be turned on. And whatever you say would be sent out to some hacker. So that's obviously illegal. Some of the companies have been known to do this. So if you know about how the TV ratings business works, so there is this company called Nielsen, right? So they actually send out surveys to people to figure out which programs are popular, which programs you're watching. There is this new company where they are actually trying to legally use your mic. So they have this minor thing in their terms of service. And if you install this application, they would periodically sample your mic with your permission. Obviously, you probably didn't know this, but you clicked on agree. <laughs> so they sample your mic, and then they try to figure out which TV programs are you watching. So they can tell whether you're watching Netflix. They can tell which songs are playing on your TV. So that is something that has gone on. But obviously, doing this without explicit user consent is illegal. If you use some free apps, and again, if you have a free app, then you obviously are the product. And you should be very careful about what those applications are doing. And again, even in the mobile space, there are some privacy enhancing applications that you can install to get rid of some of this tracking and some of these um, situations. That is all the questions that we have at this time. Uh, I, we would be concluding our program. On behalf of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, please give a very warm thank you to Zubair Shafiq for his presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs and the University of Iowa's Honors Program and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And we also thank today's uh, special sponsors, Bridget and Adam Ingersoll, and Dave and Diane Martin. And we thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available for viewing audiences. Zubair, as a small token of our appreciation, we present you with the highly coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. Thank you. Thank you, Zubair. <laughs> we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.